half of the job is playing football, lifting weights, sleeping and resting and recovering. And then really a big percentage of my job was just trying to maintain muscle mass by eating. And I would work out five, six times a week, even during the season, just to keep the muscle yeah. on. Welcome to the show where we help you make smart nutrition simple. If you want proven nutrition strategies to help you build a better body and create the energy to show up for your family without overly restrictive and unrealistic dieting, then you're in the right place. Make sure to subscribe and enjoy this episode. Not many people can walk onto a college football team having never played a down of high school football and end up in the NFL. But my next guest on the Smart Nutrition Made Simple show did just that. Today, I chop it up with Nick Hardwick. Nick is a former NFL center for the San Diego Chargers turned one-on-one -on -one fitness and nutrition coach. He is the owner of Hardwick Life, a health and wellness company that focuses on helping individuals reclaim their health and their lives. Nick also serves as a certified NFL transition coach to help former NFL players successfully navigate the oftentimes difficult process of transition out of the highest level of professional athletics. In today's discussion, we talk a lot about Nick's experience in high school, collegiate and professional sports, the nutritional protocols he was using to gain and maintain weight in the NFL, and the injury that ended his 11-year NFL career. We talk about his transition from professional athlete to everyday life, the struggles he encountered figuring out his new identity, and the unique nutritional protocol he used to shed a massive amount of weight post-NFL. Finally, we talk about his biggest frustrations as a fitness and nutrition coach, why we all deserve to be healthy and make ourselves a priority, and how he shows up as a father and sets an example for his kids. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Nick Hardwick. Nick Hardwick, welcome to the Smart Nutrition Made Simple show. What's going on, man? Thank you, Ben. Uh, just having a great day, having a great week, and enjoying life. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. I'm, I'm excited to have you on. I love these conversations uh, with like-minded individuals in health and fitness and, and creating change in the world. Um, you've got an interesting background, an interesting story, um, and journey that took you into health and fitness. Why don't you just give us a little bit of background for those that might not know who you are? Sure. Uh, Nick Hardwick, I guess I'm probably most well known for being a center in the National Football League. I started for the San Diego Chargers at the time for 11 years. I was a high school wrestler. I did not play high school football. I walked on to Purdue, the football team where I was just going to school. I was planning on being a Marine. I was on a Marine Corps scholarship, ROTC. And I had a buddy ask me to walk onto the football team. And at the time, I weighed 230 pounds. And did you say you played high school football? I did not. No, I was you, a. Oh, you wrestled. That's right. I was a wrestler. I weighed 171 pounds my senior year of high school there are a lot of calorie restriction I actually right. lost i lost 48 pounds my senior year to make weight oh so i started at 218 got down to 171 got back up to about 195 my freshman year of college just through good nutrition and working out and being with the marines and doing all the right right physical training and all that we had to do at 6 a.m every single morning which was tremendous and I think I hit puberty again in college because I was in such a long caloric deficit for years being a wrestler that yeah. I actually grew, I grew two inches in college. So I went from 195 to 230, just doing the same things. And I was very lean at 230. And I had a friend ask me to walk on. And it was the year that Purdue went to the Rose Bowl for the first time since 1967, won the Big Ten Conference for the first time since 67, and Drew Brees was the quarterback. So I was watching Drew from the stands, and it looked like a great idea to try to walk <laughs> on to the football Ambitious, team after, for sure. after having not have played high school football. And apparently it was such a great idea that there was 105 other boys that tried at the same time. Probably every kid who played high school football decided they were going to try to walk on 
to Purdue that year. I was one of five that made it. I have no idea why they chose me, actually. I think it was probably, I had a high and tight. I wore my Marine Corps PT gear to try out. So I probably stood out and looked a little bit different than everybody else. And I guess they figured if I was willing to be a Marine that I was yeah. willing to throw my body around and do that. And I made the team. Three years later, I'm getting drafted with the third pick and the third round of the 2004 NFL draft. I started from day one when I got to San Diego and I was forced to retire after week one of the 2014 season, which was my 11th season. After 146 games, career starts, my neck just started breaking down and yeah. I had stenosis and bone spurs and bulging discs and I couldn't feel my fingers. I couldn't use oh, my hands all that brutal. well. So I ended up having to shut down. And right then I decided I was going to lose weight because I knew what it was like to be skinny. So when you left the NFL, what, what did you weigh in at? 295. So you played Two, around 295 pounds for your yes. career. Yes. What did my you biggest have... that I ever got was 308 during my career. Man, that's nuts. And, and wait, so in for context, what do you weigh now? I weigh 235 right now. Okay. So, so about what I walked onto the football team is just kind of my natural resting weight. Yeah. And, and what did you have to do throughout your career to kind of maintain that weight that <laughs> close to 300 pounds, <laughs> especially because it seems like, yeah, I mean, you seem like, you know, not necessarily like an ectomorph, not necessarily like a naturally skinny guy, maybe more meso, like just naturally good lean muscle tissue. That's right. Right. And yes. And so propensity to put on lean muscle mass like you did your freshman year of college. Um, but obviously it's extenuating circumstances when you need to walk around at 295 in season. That's right. Yeah. To the first thing that happened to me when I walked onto the football team was they quickly moved me from the linebacker room when they realized that I was too slow to play linebacker. They've moved me to the defensive tackle room and I get in this room and there's Men that weigh 330 pounds, 310 was kind of the average. And I looked around and I said, how'd you gain all the weight? Yeah. And one of the <laughs> one of the guys said, well, on top of everything you eat during the day, eat two Jimmy John's gargantuan subs and that'll put the weight on. So I started there. <laughs> and then on top of that, I would eat two pounds of ground beef a day. It was at a time when EAS was a big yeah, supplement sure. and I would have the Myoplex shakes. I would have the, two of those a day. The strawberry was, ones that strawberry, are just like yeah. super thick. I, I do. I feel you. Yes. Yeah. I'd have 700 calories. I'd actually make one before I went to bed at night and set it on my nightstand. And I would set my alarm for 2 a.m. And I would chug 700 calories, go take a pee and come back to bed and sleep till six when we had doesn't, to go work out. Doesn't get more anabolic than that, man. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's exactly awesome. right. So it was, it was, uh, you know, half of the job is playing football, lifting weights, sleeping and resting and recovering. And then really a big percentage of my job was just trying to maintain muscle mass by eating. And I would work out five, six times a week, even during the season, just to keep the muscle yeah. on. So if just I didn't the, work out, it would just seem to fall just off. For of like my bones. the muscle protein synthesis, just yeah. to stimulate just the muscle stay, fibers. Stay pumped. Yeah, that's exactly right. I know you have a couple kids. You're married. Did you get married while you were in the league? I did. Yes. I got married my third year in the league. Okay. And. We ended up waiting five years before we had kids. And so my kids were three and one when I ended up retiring, which is if I were to have any regrets, not that you care about my career, is that I didn't have my kids sooner in marriage. So they could have been yeah, more privy to what was going on. I think they would have been really enjoyed that watching their dad play and kind of understanding what was happening. Do you think that it would have been harder though for you as a father? Um potentially in maybe role model and pre from a presence standpoint? Possibly. And that's, we actually left San Diego when I got done playing because of that, because when you're out in public and everybody knows who you are and they want to take pictures and sign autographs and everything, sure. it's hard to be dad. And so we're in Indiana now, more anonymity, and I just get to be dad. Yeah. And th that's my number one goal in life is to be a great dad and give the that. kids what they need. I've had my turn. Now I'd like them to 
have their turn and be as good as they possibly can. So yes, but I think we could have made it work. I think we could have sure. figured out how to make that work, but it it all works out the way that it's intended to. Oh, totally. And and so you got out of the league, you're 295, um, and you're like, well, I got to lose this weight. So Got to get the weight off. What did that Gotta look like? Off. I mean, how how hard was that? How easy was that? What did you do? I was super into nutrition when I was playing. I tried everything. Every offseason was a new experiment. I didn't know nearly what I know now. I wish I did, you know, as they say. Well, right. If I only yeah. if I only knew then what I sure. know now, then I probably could have eked out a few more years. And but I ended up coming up with this a protocol for myself. And it was very extreme. And basically, I split everything into 600 calorie meals that were fairly equally composed, isonutrient, and I would have about 50 grams of protein, about 50 grams of carbs, and about 20 grams of fat or so, so isonutrients. And one day, I would have four of those meals. One The next day, I would have two of those meals. The next day, I would have three of those meals. And the last day, I would have one 600 calorie meal. And I would do that four, two, three, one type cycle. Yeah. And I ended up, I ended up doing that for five months and I lost 85 pounds and I went from 295. Actually, I got down to 202 was my lowest after a hot yoga class. So I I basically stopped lifting weights. I started doing yoga. I walked all the time and I would do body weight, calisthenic type stuff. And I just put myself in a caloric deficit and yeah, a hefty one at that. I mean, you're a what, hefty highest, one. Yeah, highest, you're 2,400 calories, lowest one meal at 600. So you're 600. calorie cycling, smart. That's right. Uh, but yeah, just uber restricting calories. How'd you feel throughout that time? I mean, you had plenty of body fat to. Uh, I, I was, yeah, I was just, <laughs> chew, I was melting like a candle because I went from when I was playing, I'd probably have six, 7,000 calories a day. So, the weight was just flying off of me. I mean, it was almost every day. I felt like I was losing two pounds for that's outrageous. And, and then you would hit little, you would stall out just a little, you know, 270. I sold out 257. I sold out 235. I sold out 220. And then you just, you just keep going. And then eventually the body just kept losing. And I got to 202 as after a hot yoga class. And I remember standing on the scale, super dehydrated. And I said, okay, three more pounds and I'm going to be under 200. And that's where I want to stop. And then I turned to the side in the mirror, just kind of checking out, you know, my work. And I saw my side profile and I looked horrible. I was so gaunt. And I thought if I walk out into this shopping mall here and there's a melee, this grandma out here is going to be able to kick my ass and I'm not going to be able to do anything about it. So I went home and I started eating more and filling back up and started training again, lifting weights. And I ended up getting back up to 230 over six, eight months. And that's kind of where I've leveled off 230, 235. And I just, I always kind of play between 240 and 230 with my composition, try to add a little more muscle, try to trim some fat off. Yeah. And- Did your wife have anything to say around that? You know, that she, <laughs> she did not like me at 200 pounds. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> you know, I think uh, she really liked the relative difference between me at 295 and her at 145. That felt right. really good. But as I was imposing on that buffer that we had created, she didn't like that. She also didn't like how my, she just didn't like how my body felt. You know, she hugged me and she'd feel ribs and spine and knees and elbows everywhere. And she just did not like it. So, she was really thankful that I've put some size back on. Well, tell us a little bit about kind of what you do now and I guess the path to getting there. My wife's kind of the one who has subtly guided me through this. She's an exercise science major. She really understands all this stuff incredibly well. But she also understands that she's not going to be able to just tell me what to do. And she's the same way. I can't just tell her what to do. She's an athlete. She's got a strong will. Yeah. She's going to show. And hopefully I ask enough questions that I can learn. So it started with that and really kind of where the whole, like getting into nutrition, coaching and health coaching and fitness and all that started was 
when I lost weight, I had a big press conference at my retirement and my appearance was so startling to some, I weighed 208 pounds at my press conference that I ended up on ESPN on pardon the interruption. And Tony Kornheiser said, well, this is just another example of a former professional athlete, professional offensive lineman losing a drastic amount of weight in a hurry, which shows that he was on performance enhancing drugs. And I'm sitting there watching this and I thought, what in the world is this guy? I'm getting accused of being on steroids while I was playing because I was able to lose weight quickly. This guy has no idea what he's talking about. I was like, I'm going to get on Twitter right now. I didn't have Instagram. I was like, I'm going to get on Twitter. I'm going to blast back at this guy. And she goes, babe, no, no, that's not, that's not how we're going to do this. What we're going to do is we're going to open an Instagram account and you're going to show people over time how you've been able to lose the weight. And then you're going to show them how you're able to maintain the weight loss. And I thought, well, that's, that's very wise of you. So thank you for that. Cause that could have gotten really, (laughs) could have gotten really ugly really quickly. Smart. But, yeah. you know, it just, she showed me who to follow. She had done precision nutrition several years after graduating and just through subscribing to, you know, Alan Aragon, yeah. Brett Contreras, BioLane, you know, yeah. Bill Campbell. I read all of their newsletters every single month as often as I can. I've got textbooks laying around. You know, I got my CSCS. So it's just kind of accumulating certifications and learning. And then at one point, and I guess, honestly, trying everything. I tried literally every diet and every fad that came around and coming to my own conclusions about them, which basically is that they all work if you stick with them and they all work for at least some time. And then eventually, you know, some of them will lead you to poor health outcomes or feeling like you can't perform the way that you want to perform. And so backing out of there. And so, I mean, I've done keto, I've done vegan, I've never done carnivore, I've done whole 30, I've done all the things, right? I came up with my own plan, which worked and I gave that plan to hundreds of people and it worked for a significant amount of them. And then just not being afraid to mess up and to get my hands dirty and to just start coaching people. And for me, that's kind of, I've really enjoyed that process, like learning, continual learning, waking up with my hair on fire and yeah, just continuing to stay up to date and helping people. And so I guess where I felt like I got really good at coaching was when I retired from the NFL, I really struggled, like mentally struggled, as as most guys do. Most military guys struggle, mo- men and women struggle, most football players that I know struggle. I don't know one that actually had like this smooth landing. Right. You know, plenty of guys take their lives, plenty of guys get into drugs and alcohol, plenty of guys have serious, serious issues that lead to divorce and separation from kids and all the things. I was actually suicidal two months after my big retirement press conference where Philip Rivers cried at the press conference. Like it couldn't have been better. It felt like the whole city of San Diego was there. And I shared that story. And then I got picked up to be, because of that, to help other guys transition out of the NFL. So I got picked up to be an NFL transition coach to help guys understand the struggle and to help them navigate that process through so we can stop losing so many lives, stop ending in divorce, stop ending in financial ruin. You know, we want guys to make the most of their NFL career and to be able to go on and live a a long, successful, happy, more or less fulfilled life. And I got to sit down with so many team clinicians. We, it was a year long training program. And every week we'd have a two hour meeting with team clinicians of how to talk to people, how to listen to people, how to ask the right questions. And after I felt like I knew enough about nutrition and fitness, that became the most important thing is reading people and understanding what they're going through, empathizing with them, but at the same time, getting them to push past those feelings or to overcome those and to perhaps re-identify as somebody who's not healthy or feels out of shape, or I'm 
you know, I'm a letdown. Like some of the things that I've heard people say about themselves really is disturbing. And then you get them through that and they've got to re-identify as somebody who's going to make healthy decisions for their own benefit, but so they can really enjoy their family and, you know, some of the experiences that they earn. So that's kind of been my journey. You know, it's accumulating all these experiences with people, gathering enough information to really help guide and steer people towards better health. And I think with the population that I work with, I'm not working with physique competitors. I'm not working with high performance athletes. I'm working with parents who are 30 to 55 that work extremely hard, long hours, have a ton of stress on their plate, want to be the best parent and husband, wife that they can possibly be, and have really put their health on the shelf to put themselves financially at a place that they feel comfortable and they do everything for everybody but themselves. Totally. And yep. you know, I, I feel like the biggest challenge is getting people to carve out time for themselves and to feel okay about that. Yeah, most definitely. I, I appreciate that. You know, well, first I appreciate the clarity around, listen, we can know enough about nutrition and fitness and there's a lot of different ways for us to do things. It's mm-hmm. it's what's going to be realistic for you. But above and beyond all of that is the need to literally change your identity through this process. And while transparently you have this very profound identity shift from, you know, being someone who's a, you know, physically, you know, uh, this this individual in the NFL to, right, just your, so to speak, everyday Joe. And that in and of itself was probably very challenging to say nothing of, obviously, the, the physical transformation that ensued. And I think it's, it's very uh, analogous to what people need to identify with in terms of saying, listen, who you were before is going to completely change. And you need to be okay with that. And this is where like the coaching and the conversations of who it is that you're trying to become and then really sort of leaning into like, well, what does that look like? What does that feel like? And how does everything that I'm currently doing in my life right now contribute to either keeping me stuck or actually propelling me right in that right direction? Exactly right. Because when you have an identity of a strong identity and you've created this one through your self-talk, through your actions on a daily basis, You're going to do everything you can in your power to feel complete by choosing actions that reflect that identity. So when I'm a professional football player, everything I do is helping me become a better center so I can be a better teammate so our team can go win a Super Bowl. That's always the goal. Well, now you're right. I'm no longer the big guy. I don't walk into a room. I don't have a commanding presence like I used to, which is a big issue for a lot. A lot of men like walking into the room and feeling imposing. You have to get over that. That's something that you have to completely shift away from. And then shifting towards a person who makes healthy decisions on a consistent daily basis so I can have the experiences that I've earned. So, And you can't. If you're not healthy, if you're 295 pounds, climbing mountains and skiing with my kids and heck playing in the backyard, throwing the ball is exhausting when you're toting around that much weight. Yeah, Everything's hard when you've got a hundred extra pounds on your body. You know, tying your shoes is doing a hundred pound good morning. That's hard. Well, yeah. You know what they say? I mean, it's, it's, it's uncomfortable either way, right? The, the pain of staying the same. Versus the pain of change. It's just sort of determining which pain you want. So through this process, one, your own, two, is having the opportunity to now coach clients for years that are undergoing uh, identity shifts. What are some of the common struggles that you see people experiencing that are perhaps limiting factors, keeping them from truly making those changes? I think the number one thing other than being able to re-identify is time management skills. I think people's time management skills struggle so incredibly badly. And 
you hear so many things and it's funny being a fitness coach. Like I, I think people don't, people that I even work with don't think it's a real job, right? They're like, well, totally. you don't work. You don't, you don't know what it's right. like. You know, I'm doing this and I'm raising kids and I'm doing all that. And I'm like, yeah, I know. And so am I. So sometimes I have to lay out my schedule for them. And during football season, it's, it's wild. Like I coach three football teams. I coach a high school football team. I'm not the head coach. I'm an offensive line coach, but it's a huge program in Indiana that I work 40 hours as a volunteer for this program every single week. I coach a travel football program, which has three practices a week, a game on the weekends. And then I coach my youngest son's fourth grade team, which is two practices and a game on the weekend. So it's you're going. Super, yeah. going. We're going. I'm waking up at five in the morning and I'm honestly working till 11 or yeah. 1130, 12 when I fall asleep on my computer, grading the boys film from the day's practice. And then I realize, all right, I probably better put this down or just send it off to him the way that it is because I don't have any more in me tonight. So, you know, I hear, yes, I'm working. I'm doing this. And I'm like, everybody's doing that. Literally mm -hmm. everybody right. is doing that. So you've got to get out of your own head that you can't also be healthy because you've got to be organized to be healthy. You've got to either go grocery shopping or use Instacart, which is a tremendous service, which we use all the time at the all house. The Just have it delivered to you. It's worth the cost. If you create a good food environment at your home, then you're going to have a much better chance at health than you would if you don't have anything at home and then you're going out and grabbing quick eats or your pantry's filled with hundreds of thousands of calories of junk, you know, you're going to, you're really creating an uphill battle. And then, well, I don't have time to work out. Well, that's good for me. Like I like, I like when they're like, I don't have time to work out. And I'm like, totally fine. I'm not concerned about your exercise. That's the number five thing on my list. My, my order of operations here that I do for health, for the population that I work with, of course. So it's like all context dependent, but most of my yeah. clients, if we get your calories under control and then we start working with your macronutrients, you and have then them we'll track work calories? On food call. I do. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So we start there, then we'll start increasing protein. And then I tell them to color in the numbers, however they choose with carbs totally. and fat at first. And then we'll start working on the composition a little bit as they start becoming a little bit more high performance. And then we worry about food quality after that. So, you know, the order of operations. And then the second thing is activity. I want you to be a mover. I want you to use your body. I don't want you stuck in a chair. I don't want you stuck in your car. I want you walking. I want you being active, playing with your kids. Nothing that's going to feel like a workout. That's number two. Number three is we have to prioritize your sleep. If we prioritize your sleep, then your hormones are going to be in a better place. They may not be optimal, but they're going to be in a better place. And your activity, your food, and your exercise decisions are all going to become better because you're well-rested and you have more energy to be able to do it. You're also going to improve your patience. You're going to improve your stress resilience. Just by sleeping, you're going to make better decisions naturally. You're going to eat less naturally. You're going to move blood, more naturally. Better it's, blood sugar control. You said everything. It. Absolutely. Everything's going to be better. And then I really like them to find some type of stress management practice. Now that naturally improves also when we get better sleep because we're better rested. So our tolerance is better. But if we can get them meditating, if we can get them working on breathing exercises, I send them yoga nidra scripts or, you know, yoga is a very gentle form of exercise that also has a calming effect. And, you know, if we can get them to carve time out for themselves, it's kind of that theme, right? It's yep. how do we get you to slow down enough to start appreciating your own life, showing yourself that you love you and that you are worth it. You know, I, yeah. I think that's a big deal is just saying I'm worth this 10 minutes of sitting on the couch with my eyes closed and doing nothing because nobody's that important that they can't take 10 minutes out of their day. And 10 minutes can be a dramatic improvement overall. And then number five is exercise. So you know, when people are like, I can't, you know, first thing I got to do, well, what, where do I got to go to the gym? Where do you got to right. I don't care what you do. Like I'll, I'll build a program out for you, but I don't care what you do. Just that's last on the list for me. So we kind of increase the stimulus as we go. But if we 
in my opinion, and with a lot of the clients that I work with who aren't habitually working out consistently already, if we race to do really hard workouts, then their nutrition's going to be jacked up. They're going to overeat. So number one, we got to get the calories under control, keep it stabilized. And then we can start adding workouts in as you're in this learning process. Hey guys, I want to interrupt this conversation briefly with an exciting announcement. If you're a father and struggling to lose the pounds that have crept on over the years, I understand your challenge. You're juggling a successful career, a loving family, and now you're looking to regain that energy and physique that seems to have slipped away. And that's exactly why I created Prime Fit Operating System. Prime Fit OS is a unique hybrid coaching program designed specifically for men like you. Now, you guys know me, we're not about quick fixes or impossible routines. Instead, we focus on real sustainable change through personalized nutrition and science-driven strength training, all wrapped up in a supportive community with expert guidance directly from me and my 20 years of experience working with men just like you. Imagine mastering your nutrition without restrictive dieting, getting stronger and leaner and boosting your overall energy, all without overwhelming your already busy schedule. With Prime Fit OS, you're getting more than just a cookie cutter nutrition and fitness plan. You're embarking on a transformative journey that fits into your life, not the other way around. So if you're ready to take the first step towards a healthier, leaner, stronger, more energetic, confident, ass kicking you, join us over at Prime Fit Operating System. Trust me guys, your family, your career, and most importantly, you will thank you for it. So if you guys are interested in getting started and want to find out more about the program, let's chat. Just head over to primefitos.com forward slash call and grab a time on my calendar. Remember, it's your time to be at your prime. With adding all of that stuff, first and foremost is like, listen, you need to be able to prioritize this in. And so if you don't have control over your schedule, like it's never going to happen consistently. Right. I, and I love matter. that you brought that up because we were just talking about that. Uh, my wife and I were just talking about that. She helps me run the business. Um, and it's just one of those pivotal things that invariably is like one of the first conversations that we have with clients that we've realized now after years and years of doing this. Um, it's like, yes, nutrition is incredibly important, but if you can't prioritize the time to plan and prepare and create structure and create that level of consistency, then we're just going to spin our wheels. Right. And so <laughs> we're just going to talk about it. We're never, right. ever, we're never, we're never like, I did to great to today. It. And then the rest of the week was a mess. Well, why? Well, because then this came up and this came, well, what, what did you have planned in? Well, I didn't, I don't have a plan. Okay. Well, that's the problem. That's right. Because everyone knows what to do. Right. Theoretically, we know what to do, but we're not doing it for a myriad of reasons. One, because typically what you think you need to do is unrealistic, uh, like a lot of the crash diet, right. bad diet type stuff that you've experimented with that I too have experimented with. But also is is simply because you don't have a plan. Right. You don't yes. have a plan in place. And so teaching people how to plan and dude. I mean, this stuff carries over into every single facet of life. You know, your kids' activities, the, the weekend, your business, I mean, your finances. It's like, it's, it's everything. And so I don't know about you, but I'm sure you see the correlation. I'm sure you've got a bunch of hard charging clients. It's like they start to prioritize themselves, which originally the concern was, oh, I don't want to take the time and take away from my business, take away from my family time. But once they do actually start to prioritize themselves, everything else gets better. Yes. <laughs> right? Yes. Yes. It, it, it really is. It's fun to watch. And how empowering that is. When, when they realize, oh my goodness, I am capable of doing this. The cool thing about the body for me is that it's very visceral. You know, they, they feel the change happening because they've had a plan. And they've stuck to the plan consistently enough to see the changes that they want to see. And then, and I'm sure you've dealt with this too, is when they undergo that transformation and they've lost 50 pounds or 75 pounds, they start to begin to think of other possibilities in their life of what they could accomplish with a dream, a vision, yes. and a plan to get there. And then consistent action to follow up 
on that plan. And when they start to do that, they realize, my goodness, I, I can accomplish a lot more than I've given myself credit for. Sky's the limit. Yes. And then that's the coolest thing as a coach. When somebody not only loses the weight, but they go, I've been wanting to do this other career for so long and I've held off right. on it because I didn't think that I was qualified to do it or I didn't deserve it. And now I know I can. And then they make a shift at 45 years old to something that they love doing that's fulfilling to them. And they're no longer, they no longer feel like they're just punching the clock. That's right. They're, they are, they are living the life that they wanted to live. And it started because they felt the changes inside. Yeah. I mean, it really, you know, it reinforces the idea of possibility. Like if I can lose this much weight, if I can take ownership over my health, if I can accomplish this, what else is possible for me? And I think that's, you know, what a good coach does is help them continue to dream and vision what the future could look like because they've just created a new future for themselves, right? Yes. So they, if they can do this in six months or a year or two years, right? What else could they possibly do? And then continue to, to reinforce is like, like we talked about in terms of some of the limiting factors of, of, of keeping people from making that identity change is like coming to the realization, well, I hate my job. <laughs> I <laughs> yeah. know that, that people, turns out I've never liked this. Exactly. It's like, yeah. well, gosh, I, would it be possible for me to do something else, something that I've always dreamed of doing? Well, why not? Right. Yes. I did this and it's just helping boost confidence, gain momentum, um, which is just such a beautiful thing. But I think it also goes back to, um, again, it's just like situations that we put ourselves into that we think we're relegated to that we don't have control over the people that we surround ourselves with the towns that we live in the jobs that we succumb to the relationships you know even intimate you know marriages and right. and 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 partners it's like you don't have to um succumb to you know those things you have the ability to make change and that's where in my opinion it's just like this it, this nutrition and fitness is is just like a stepping stone, you know? Yes. It's yes, 100 percent Here's another challenge that I face, and I'm sure you've you faced this. So maybe you have some solutions for this that I don't have. And it's just something that I've realized recently. So I I work with a lot of big clients that'll start at 330, 340. And so a huge number for a lot of them is 300 pounds. Yeah. Like it, they just think if they could get under 300 pounds, they haven't imagined being that weight in a long time. Well, when they get there, for me, that's not the end of the ride. Right. You know, we got to keep going. We got 30, 40 more pounds that we'd really like to carve off before we're at a safer place. You know, like 300 pounds is not that, for me, not that safe. It's not totally. that healthy, you know, right. you don't see many 300 pounders living to be 75, 80 years old. You just don't. And that's, I don't have numbers on that, but. I think that's super fair. I mean, most anec people anecdotally are metabolically yeah. are, you know, not going to, there, there's going to be significant risk at that weight for most people. Yeah. Yes. And not, and, and part of it is it's so degenerative on your joints, right. you know, your back takes a pounding, your hips take a pounding, your knees, your ankles, all that your feet, and then you don't move as much. And when you don't move as much, then your brain really suffers. And you just really start this slow decay process because you can't be as active as you need to be. And so I'm like, good, we got to 300 pounds. What's our next goal? And then a lot of times I'm like, I got a radio silence. Nah. And I'm like, hey, checking in on you. And what really happens is they've kind of achieved a level that they never thought that they were going to get to again. And they get complacent. That's and what I was going to say, yes. And they just kind of, they settle for that and they get content there, which is fine. Hey, you get to choose your own adventure and that's completely fine. But as a coach, that's one of the most frustrating components is when you get to a place that you know is about halfway and they're like, I'm good here. Yeah. Where, where if we were to go climb Mount Kilimanjaro, you wouldn't make it to the third base camp and then turn around and be satisfied totally. with that. So yeah. why are we stopping halfway? Let's continue to go. There's, there's even more if we push right. through this barrier here. 
Yeah, I mean, and so it, trying to get ahead of that, you know, I, with messaging and you know on check ins and you know see where they're struggling and and really trying to get a read for where we're at mentally as we're going along. That way we can perhaps get ahead and then just being perfectly honest with them. Like I've seen this happen a lot now. You know, you've, you've reached a big milestone. We've got to keep going. Well, that's it. I think that is the key is being perfectly honest and setting realistic expectations um, for them from the get go. And, and that's where it's like, listen, you, I mean, you know, it's, it's just gaining clarity on, all right, well, why is it that you want this? Like, what ultimately do you want, right? Yep. What do you want to be able to do that you you currently can't do? How do you want to feel? How do you want to look? Who do you want to surround yourself with? What sort of relationships do you want to develop? Like, you know, especially for guys like us, you know, we start to think we're much, probably much more um, driven by longevity and relationships and setting a good example for our family and our communities at this point in our lives. And it's, there, there's much less ego involved. So yes. it's not so much the body composition or the weight per se, but it's really the life that we want to live, the impact that we want to make. And that's where it's for, for these types of clients, like, listen, one, everyone's going to, going to hit those plateaus and that's okay. I think that has to happen. Like That's we never right. see these linear journeys um, where it's very rare where someone will lose a significant amount of weight and just stay there, right? There's right. always these hiccups along the way. One, just you know, that's how the body works. But two is usually it's, it's the transitions that we need to make through this identity shift, right? Like that's you right. realize, all right, the social situations, the people I'm surrounding myself with, the, the common obstacles. Um, I think it's the same in business. It's like there's levels, right? Where you're that's right. Um, you need to change as a person in order to be able to continue to grow. So as a coach, as we're nurturing them through this process and the tools that we give them, the skills that they're developing change along the way so that they can continue to move through those, you know, potential roadblocks. That's right. Uh, but at the end of the day is for us as a coach is like, hey, we're setting the expectations from the get-go, whether it's verbal for us of like, we're actually expressing what we envision happening or we already are envisioning it, but we're kind of telling them what they want to hear and giving them what they need, right? It's saying, listen, I know he's going to get down. Like he needs to be at 250, right? I don't know how long it's going to take. Here's going to be the what the trajectory is going to look like. And then how we're expressing that to them, right? I think that's the art of, of the, the process here, right? That's right. Yeah. And that's, I, I try to let them know as we get going, this is a very long, hard process, right? I'm your guide through this. So I'm, I'm the Sherpa that's going to help you get up to the top of this mountain. Yeah. But believe me, there's going to be times that you want to quit. There's going to be times that you've had enough and you want to go home. It's my job to help you get through that and push through those barriers and get over that ice crevasse and right. you know to to walk with your crampons over the ladder and do all those things like we we will come up with solutions for the problems that you're facing in life and that's I do like longer term clients because you get to be with them through some more of those seasonal cycles holidays, birthdays, work travel, work right. dinner, social events, all of those things. How do we navigate those? And then the psychological component is that's that's the one. You know, getting them to a place where no this I can still go further. Yep. You do have more in you. Yeah. Just trust the process and be patient. You know, they hit a right. little plateau and it's like I guess that's it. No, 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 that's not it. Just keep working and keep hammering the habits and eventually we'll get to where you want to be. And by the way, if you need to take a break, take a break. You know, hey, if you want two weeks and we're going to come back up to maintenance calories, fine. If you don't want right. to work out for the next two weeks because you're feeling fatigued and exhausted and all that, fine. You know, that's right. I'm fine with that. We can go. I, my kind of thing that I do is, you know, the stock market is not linear, but it goes up and down and up and down and up and down. Well, weight loss is the stock market in reverse. That's right. We're going to we're going to drop and then we're going to level off and then we're going to bump up a little bit and then we're going to drop a little bit more. So you just have to trust that over time you're going to look back at your progress and you go, "Wow. Yeah, that was amazing. That was a that was an amazing thing." 
But that's the conversation though, that no one's the conversation. That's the conversation that needs to happen, right? Mm -hmm. That's just the forthcoming. Again, when I said setting realistic expectations, that's what I'm talking about. It's like, listen, man, there's no, you know, magic pills or potions here. It's like, this is what things are going to look like. And it's, there's times when it's going to feel easy and there's times when it's feel really fucking hard and that's okay. Like that's good. Right. Because, you know, that's when growth happens. Um, just like anything that's been valuable in your life, uh, and any progress you've made has been really Everything. challenging, right? And and so that's where the narrative has to shift, in my opinion, with diet culture, is to have a coach where they're openly having these conversations. Like, listen, if you're looking for the quick fix here, if you're looking to, you know, to drop fifty pounds in ninety days. Um, and you're okay gaining it back or not infusing the skills and the behaviors that are going to allow you to keep it off, then this isn't the right fit. Like we're not the right fit here and and it's fine. It's like, it doesn't make you a bad person, but you know, we want clients who are going to be successful long-term. I'm totally happy to turn down money right? for the right. I just want the right clients. And I've learned that over time where, you know, when you're first getting started, you'll just take clients. Right. Well, I got to, I got to get my reps in. I got to work with people. Hey, the doors are open. This is great. You know, business is going fine, but I felt like I would much rather have a much smaller paycheck at the end of the month and have less kind of anguish over my failures as a coach, because I allowed the wrong people into my program, you know, that weren't really ready. I won't talk somebody into joining the program. I want people who are ready to make a big change in their life and are fed up with the old way of living and they want the experiences they they want more out of it so i'm i'm perfectly that's become a huge revelation for me here in the last year is just finding clients that i want to work with and i think it's I enjoy, yeah that i enjoy spending time with i don't yeah. do this for the money i i played a long time in the nfl i saved it all i don't need the money what I do it for the challenge of learning a new business. And I do it because I like helping people. I, I want them to know what this feels like on a daily basis because this is great. Right. You know, to have abundant energy and to be the dad that you want to be because you've got the patience and the tolerance and you can give your wife, you know, the husband that she signed up to get. You know, when you can do that, man, you feel really good about yourself when you go to sleep at night. Most you know, definitely. when you when you're having an impact in your community and people are thankful when you show up, like that's a cool spot to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you can't do it if you're not healthy. Can't do it. Don't have the energy. Don't have the stamina. Yeah, yeah, and you got to be willing to commit to the long term. There's there's no shortcuts here. That's right. Um, and so. I'm glad that, you know, I'm glad we're on the same page there, but also just sharing this message with, you know, with our listeners, because I, I mean, I've repeated probably every single conversation that I have. So, uh, you know, you guys know who are listening, you know, our viewpoints on things, but it's, it's like, you got to be ready to make change and we can help you to identify what that actually looks like, but you gotta be willing to kind of roll your sleeves up and, and dig in. Cause it's going to be some work. Like we can, you know, we can make because it. you can't do it for them. That's, that's right. That's right. I'd we love, can't. I'd love to do all the work for you, but uh, sorry, I can't do that. Yeah, yeah. too many people. You're... We want it more for them than they want it for themselves. What does dad life look like now? You know, you're you're obviously running another business. You're obviously very busy individual. Um, and so, you know, how are you showing up as a father? How do you think about infusing healthy eating and exercise behaviors? for your kids. Again, my wife kind of takes the lead on this. And because if it were up to me, we would probably be a little bit more militant. And okay. Okay. Little, but just yeah, well, because, you and me both. Yeah, this is naturally I'm a little more hardcore and a little bit more extreme, but I've just learned through her and I watch her parents. She's so good at it. And the way she speaks to the kids and the way she kind of effortlessly gets them to do things that maybe they didn't want to do at first. But it's through her language skills that she gets them to do that, where I'm more like a a battering ram and I come in and I'm like, hey, we're doing this. And they're like, "Uh, no, my tactics are really, I want to show you first the results of living 
the way that we are choosing to live. You know, I want I want you to be, you'll see it with your own eyes. You're going to see me making healthy decisions. You're going to see me working out consistently. You're going to see me relative to other dads that are my age and you're going to go which option do you want to choose, A or B? Right? So you're going to see that, you're going to feel it and you're just going to know it. They're just going to know it. And then we have since they were born, we've we talk about what we eat, we talk about why we eat it. We, my boys, since they were five years old, could identify protein, carbs, and fats. They can, they know what is on the spectrum, what is healthier decisions than less healthy decisions. And we ask them to listen to their body. And my wife shared a story recently of how we changed our tactics early on when there was no way I was letting donuts into our house or treats or anything like that early on. No way, but you know, not, not in this house. And I took my oldest son at the time to a dad's and donuts event at his school. And I was just caught up talking to the dads, having coffee and Hudson must've had six donuts. And yeah. he was, yes. his head was spinning. He was thrown up all over the place. He had never had that. And we realized at that point, it can't be such an all or nothing deal where this is the world that we live in. There are going to be donuts that show up at the workplace. There is going to be food that is probably less than desirable that at times you're going to be peer pressured into or whatever. So we can't necessarily have this, well, we don't do this type philosophy because when it does happen, we want them to be armed with I've had that before. It was fine. And in small doses, it's totally okay. But I can't have five of those, you know, and I I can have one of those. And then what did that make me feel like? Like for, for a while, my boys were waking up and they're like, hey, can we get Lucky Charms for breakfast? Okay. And I, I'm like, absolutely not. My wife's like, just let them have it. And then eventually my youngest would come home and he'd be like, mom, I am so hungry. By the time lunch comes around, can we have something else for breakfast? It doesn't seem like the cereal's working. It's like, yeah, you can. Cool. Yeah. So they you kind of use their own intuition. And she believes, and I and I in our house, I believe this is true. And a lot of healthy homes, I think this is true. Kids raised in a healthy home have a very strong natural governor that they know when they're full, they'll stop eating. And so we won't go, hey, you got to finish your plate. You got to right. have the clean yeah. plate award. We Okay. You, are you full? Are you sure? Did you eat your protein? Did you have your vegetables? Okay. You don't want anything else? Okay. Fine. You're, you're free to roam. You know, get up and yeah. do your thing. Take your dish back up and clean it up. And so not being so just stuck in that old clean plate award, you're going to eat whatever's on there can't have any sweets or treats or anything like that. We let them have it. Hey, mom, can I get a bite of ice cream after dinner? Sure. And they'll go to the freezer and they'll grab out a little pint or whatever. They'll take two bites and they'll put it back. Yeah. Well, that's an amazing regulation. It's self-regulation at its finest. And my, what my words to her were, they're really lucky that they live in this house, that we give them the proper nutrients in their body before we allow them to just indulge in whatever they want to indulge in. Because there are plenty of houses where they're not filling up with protein, not filling up with fibrous veggies, not eating whole grains or healthy fats. They're not getting any of those signals to their body to stop eating. So they just head to the pantry over and over and over again and end up in the bottom of that animal cracker jar. Right. And I promise there's no protein or fiber or vitamins in there. So I, I caution her to say, yeah, kids do have strong internal governors, but only if they're getting the proper nutrition. And I believe that with everybody. If we're feeding our, if we're nourishing our bodies, then we got a great chance to stop eating when our body's full. But if we're filling up with garbage, our body's going to continue to walk itself back to the pantry into the fridge, looking for that protein and fiber until right. it's topped off with weight and volume. And it's like, all right, I guess I've had enough and enough calories. What do you say to parents that complain about their kids' eating behaviors? 
<laughs> look at your own <laughs> look at, loaded look at, loaded look question. at yeah look, yeah look at your own behavior and then as we say in the the football world you're either coaching it to happen or you're allowing it to happen either way it's your responsibility so clean up your food environment you know clean if if you don't like the way your kids are eating why do we have these snacks laying around that they seemingly can't avoid starts you know, with I, you mom and dad that's right starts with you it starts with it you, starts guys with you. We have all these picky, quote unquote, picky eaters. I'm like, listen, you know, it's it's your eating behaviors. Like you're allowing this stuff. You're cooking them the chicken tenders and the mac and cheese and 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 making it easy for them to throw tantrums because they won't eat the real food. And it's like it listen, giving it, into those, giving into those tantrums. Because it's because it's easier. Well, it's not going to be easier long term for them or for you. It's going to cause them more pain at the end of the day. It hurts me. As, as it probably does you, it hurts me to see an overweight child. It that there's it's so hurtful. It's to see that that kid in 20 years is going to have struggles right. his whole or his or whole whole life because they have not been able to get their head around nutrition and how to eat properly and how to feel full and how to listen to those signals. They don't know anything about nutrition. And it starts with the parents and they just continue this culture of bad food in their house. And they're really setting their kids up for disease and for struggle and for emotional issues because now I'm so out of shape that it's very difficult to work out, which is one of the best ways to stave off anxiety, stress, depression. It's working out. But if yeah. you're so far gone, if you're so far down in that hole, picking yourself back up and digging yourself out is very, very challenging. We get it. it it's it's a hard conversation for parents. And it, listen, I mean, I have three kids. They're 14, 12, and eight. Um, and we have plenty of friends whose kids are overweight. And it definitely starts with the parents. And so you know, it's not supposed to be easy. It's not going to be easy, uh, but y- you know, it's it's our responsibility as parents at the end of the day here to do anything that we can to teach our kids, you know, healthy eating behaviors, how to become a responsible, healthy adult. Um, and it all starts with your, you know, you taking care of yourself and setting the example. That's it's right. Fundamentally, like it's you got to, you know take a look in the mirror here. It starts with you. So the very best thing that you can do is just show up and lead by example. And if you don't know what to do, you've got a great resource here with Nick, with myself. Um, Nick, for people that are interested, for our listeners that are interested in finding out more about you, uh, where can they go? Just go to my Instagram account, Nick Hardwick, at Nick Hardwick. And that'd be the greatest place to start. And then in my bio, you can find links to wherever. To, Great. to our website, to our Facebook group, to all that. Great. We've got, uh, we'll have all of your contact links in the show notes below. So um, go follow Nick on Instagram. Um, check out his website if you're interested in being coached. Obviously, Nick, you're taking on clients, I'm assuming. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Help as many as we can. Love it. Uh, you and me both, you're in good company, my friend. Dude, thank you so much for your time and energy and wisdom. Uh, absolute pleasure, honor to have the opportunity to speak with you and and uh, share the love with our listeners. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Ben. And I really enjoyed our conversation and I'll keep tuning in. Sounds good, brother. Talk soon. Thank you so much for listening. And if you found this content valuable, here are four ways I can help you in your nutrition journey for free. One, Grab a free copy of my Fat Loss Fix Guide at fatlossfixguide.com. Two, join my free group at smartnutritionmadesimple.com. Three, subscribe to my YouTube channel at smartnutritionmadesimpletv.com. Four, leave a five-star rating and positive review so that we can gain access to more nutrition experts ready to share their knowledge with you and ultimately help more people make smart nutrition simple.